Simply Scuba presents the Deco Stop Podcast. Hi everybody, welcome to the Deco Stop Podcast. I'm Mark, a former dive instructor, and I'm here to talk about scuba diving and stuff. Um, so with website updates, a few new bits and bobs. Oh yeah, it's, it's been over a week since... Um, uh, since I've spoken to you guys, so uh, yeah, welcome back. Um, yeah, last week it was a long weekend over here in the uh, in the UK. If you're not from here, um, it was the Queen's seventieth uh, Platinum Jubilee thing, celebrating how long she's reigned the country, basically. Um, so yeah, we we all got a, a four day weekend, which was very nice. Uh, but of course, I didn't have time to uh, to record the podcast last week. Um, but looking at the Simply Scuba website, a few new updates. The um, uh, the main ones that I could see were the Big Blue AL450NMT2 dive torch, very snappy name. Um, the 450 basically means the um, uh, the, the lumens, uh, how bright it is. So 450 lumens is is pretty decent. Uh, this is quite a compact little torch. It's uh, it's more of a backup torch, but actually, if you're diving in like blue waters on a night dive or something, this would actually be plenty. Um, the T stands for tail. It's got a button on the tail, which is quite nice. Um, and the two is just, it's, this is the second version of it. Uh, so yeah, if you need a, um, a compact little dive torch, the uh, the big blue one is, uh, is pretty cool. They usually come in... Um, uh, roll top dry bags as well, which is quite nice. So um, I, I haven't done the video for this yet, so I can't confirm whether it definitely does. It's just a lot of their um, their other torches do come with them. We also have the second generation of the Santi heating vest, which is, yeah, just as it sounds, it's a, it's a heating vest that you wear underneath your dry suit. And this is, it, it's both thermal itself, so it's boosting that uh, that insulation over your core, but it also has new heating wires that have a very soft but rugged silicone outer coating. So it's both flexible, so you don't really notice it, and it's tough as well, so it's not going to to um, uh, sort of get damaged through all those like bending and movements but it's a, a three layer material as well it's both breathable on the inside so you're nice and comfortable when it kind of wicks moisture and sweat away from your body but it's also windproof on the outside or it says it has windproof properties um, to help cut the wind when you're on the surface of course, you need a, an external battery and a Santi Therma valve or one of their connectors to be able to get the power into the uh, on the inside of the dry suit. But yeah, we got the, the new upgraded version of their heating vest and also all sorts of new bits and bobs from uh, from Maris from their 2022 range. Um, the two that stood out for me at the moment that are on the website were the uh, the Maris XR, the XRM Stream diving mask, which is a if you know the Oceanic Shadow Mask, uh, it's kind of that, basically, um, but the, the Maris XR version of that, so a frameless single lens mask, but it comes with a neoprene strap on the back, um, so stronger than a traditional silicone strap, and um, and also it still has the, the stretch, but it's not going to actually like grab and tangle onto your hair, which is quite nice. Um, and the Maris XR, the, um, the XR Rec, Ice, which is a single backplate and harness setup. The whole thing, um, as the name suggests, is designed for cold water diving. So if you're diving here in the UK, uh, it's starting to warm up now. But if you want to continue to dive uh, in the uh, in the colder months. And then of course you need all that additional insulation so then you need to carry even more lead to help you get down um, so this set it comes with a six mil stainless steel back plate so the entire thing weighs about 7.3 kilos so that's a lot of extra trim weight um, but otherwise it is a very tough um, sort of external shell that's protecting the internal bladder uh, it's designed for singles but you can upgrade and um, uh, and fit a twin wing onto that as well so you can dive twins um, it comes with integrated weight um, pockets but you can remove them if you don't want integrated weights uh, and fit them to, uh, to something else uh, but this is a very heavy duty uh, sort of back mount system and it has a, a mil spec uh, quick disconnect buckle on the left hand shoulder strap only on the left hand shoulder strap so it's not completely dir but it just makes your life so much easier getting in and out of the bcd especially if you're wearing dry suits and under suits and everything um, just to have that quick release clip on one shoulder strap just makes life a lot easier 
Uh, moving on to social channel updates and things. Uh, so on Friday on Ask Mark, I was uh, I was answering questions about adding color to your fins. Uh, what can you use to um, uh, to add a splash of color? Uh, I did a bit of research afterwards. I mean, my main ones were uh, the ones that stick to my mind are, are bright mark. I see that quite a lot online, um, and that's um, that 3M um, was it Scotch Light tape, the uh, the reflective stuff that you get on um, uh, 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 oh, buoyancy jackets and things, um, life vests, and your uh, your DSMB is is that reflective tape and. Um, and yeah, I think most people seem to uh, to concur with that. There are a few others, but it's it's really tricky because it has to be environmentally friendly. Um, it has to be uh, resistant to water, but also resistant to flexibility as well, because your fins are constantly bending and flexing. With a lot of paints, as soon as you do that, and um, and and they're really set. They they just sort of shatter and then, then they uh, they flake off. So it's no real good. And also in the manufacturing process, um, a lot of the um, uh, the materials after they're cast, they they're sprayed with a release agent to um, to get it out of that cast. So um, yeah, this release agent. It's, it's similar stuff that uh, that gets into your um, uh, into a brand new mask, and that's what causes it to fog up. So you've got to get rid of that first. So if they're brand new fins, uh, you just have to um, uh, sort of either scuff it off, uh, use some real fine grit sandpaper um, to uh, to basically get that off. But also, if you have like a, a high gloss finish as well, you kind of have to um, uh, sort of scuff that surface up so that the can actually grab hold and uh, and stick to the fin but me personally I'm not a huge fan of it just because I, I don't know exactly how long it's it's gonna last I have done it before in the past um, but it it did end up flaking off um, luckily I was in the swimming pool when I uh, when I noticed it and you're like oh it's truth okay it only lasted about a season or two maybe um, so it and this was the uh, this was like a proper flexible stuff designed for scuba diving. And you're like, oh, you know what? Nah, I'm, I'm just not going to bother. Um, but I have seen plenty of people online sort of saying, oh no, you can you can get this. It's it's kind of like um, uh, expensive duct tape, and and it comes with like patterns on it and stuff, so you can get flames down your fins and things. Um, so yeah, ha have a look around and um, just sort of make sure you're, you're applying it correctly. Um, then I was talking about ponies. Um, someone was asking if they fit a pony cylinder to one side of their back mounted single, whether they'd need to adjust their weighting accordingly. And the, the usual answer is kind of, probably. Um, it, it's hard to give a definitive answer. Um, but if, if you've got an aluminium pony, it's less of an issue because there's less of a change or a shift in buoyancy to one side. If it's stainless steel, then probably because they tend to be quite negatively buoyant. So you do need to counteract that and move some lead or at least take some lead off one side so you're a bit more equal. Um, but that's the whole point of check dives, just to literally put all your gear on, jump in the water, see what you're doing um, and, uh, and see if you do need to shimmy some lead around. A couple questions on uh, on dive knives. The first one they were asking for a uh, recommendation on a knife to go on your belt to tuck a uh, long primary hose donate hose underneath it. Um, I just use my uh, my DIR zone dive knife. Uh, that's literally what they call it. They uh, they don't come up with fancy names for any of the uh, bits and bobs. Um, but otherwise, I think there was a um, uh, uh, what's it called easy easy cuts trilobite um, uh, uh, sheath option for that where it had a, a drop down sheath I'm not sure if they still make it because uh, they have changed their lineup um, sort of well probably in the last year or so I think um, and I'm not uh, sort of up to speed but otherwise you can actually make your own because like with my one all the um, all the DIR zone dive knife sheath is is just an off cut of, um, of nylon two inch harness webbing and and that's just folded over a couple of times to create a loop and then a uh, sort of a catchment for your dive knife and then it's sewn down the sides and that's kind of it so if you're fitting relatively handy with a sewing needle um there's there's no reason why you can't sort of make your own obviously you need a dive knife that 
fits. Um, the DIR zone is relatively compact compared to a lot of other dive knives, but it's it's an option that's out there for you. Um, and the other question was about the uh, the titanium um, parts. It was a great question, and um, they dive with a Scuba Pro Mako titanium dive knife, uh, which I actually have as well, and. They were saying how it's, it's great that the knife itself is titanium, so it can't rust. But what about the spring mechanism inside of that um, the sheath? Because you have to push a button to release the knife. And what's what's the point in having this like really fancy, pretty expensive uh, titanium dive knife that doesn't rust if the spring mechanism can rust and will just drop my dive knife uh, if it ever um, uh, if ever rusts and breaks and um, so I pulled mine apart just to see what it was and the the three screws that were holding the the plastic case together they had that um, very telltale white um, sort of dusty finish to it um, which made me think huh it's just gonna be stainless steel isn't it uh, it's just got salt build up on the on the screws but then when I actually pulled the uh, the spring out, the spring was pristine. So um, I, I don't know 100%, but my gut feeling says that I reckon that is titanium. So um, yeah, well done to, uh, to Scuba Pro for, um, for that. Otherwise, it might just be that it's easier to, um, uh, to wash it. But that dive knife, I, I have no idea how many dives that's um, sort of been with me on. So I, I think it's fine and it doesn't get washed religiously after every single dive it it does get washed but it's not my primary focus in a lot of cases it just ends up being left inside of my thigh pocket um because i always think well hey it's titanium it's not the end of the world um but yeah the uh, the actual metal parts and the spring on the inside of the uh, the sheath i think a titanium i don't know 100 percent, but it, it looks and feels like titanium and somebody asked if it was worth vacuum packing their wetsuit when they were traveling to uh, to help reduce weight and whether that would, uh, not weight, sorry, uh, volume, um, and whether that would affect the, uh, the thermal properties of the wetsuit. And again, it's another one of those, mm, probably, uh, I, I wouldn't do it myself and I've never seen it myself. Um, and it's, I kind of get where they're, they're coming from because it's this uh, this foam material to uh, to help reduce the uh, the whole size of it. Um, why wouldn't you put it in one of those bags that you zip lock up and then um, uh, attach the vacuum cleaner to, and it kind of scrunches it down? But that's kind of what happens to uh, to dry suits, no, sorry, wet suits during a dive and over repetitive dives and repetitive compressions they do lose their um, their warmth so it, it's not something that i'd uh, that i'd recommend and i don't think it's a huge issue um with um sort of wetsuits because i think nowadays with a lot of travel you can dive with or you can so you can fly with two smaller bags instead of just one big big bag um so no no i don't think so and also uh, you're gonna get creases wherever it's folded, so it's it's really not worth it. Um, Saturday's answered was on scuba. Um, funny enough, I, I literally no. With all of those, I think of a topic to um, to type into uh, to Google to see what questions come up, and um, and I, I was I've been through most of them. I was like, mm, and, and I literally just typed in scuba just to think about scuba wetsuit or scuba fins or something and then I thought you know what let's just run with scuba and see what comes up and a, a few interesting ones came up um, on Sunday which is uh, today uh, if you listen to this on Sunday if not it was yesterday or the day before um, the dive brief was on dry suit component parts uh, with those new avatar dry suits and uh, and their undersuits that arrived last week um, I, I figured I'd, I'd break down a few of your choices when you're looking at dry suits because the 101 dry suit from avatar is a great like showcase of uh, a whole bunch of them from the, um, the the cuff seals you have a, a ring system on that so you can quickly swap over cuffs but they're not silicone they're latex and uh, thigh pockets as well with actual mounting points on the inside so you can clip things off inside of the pockets um, tech boots with neoprene uh, ankles so you have good flexibility and like breathable materials all, all those kind of things um, so yeah just check that out and on Tuesday I've got 10 top tips on 
boys, uh, not young children, but on uh, on surface marker boys and uh, and how to uh, sort of deploy them. And um, just again, a few tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years that will hopefully make your life a little bit easier. Moving on to the news, the first big news story comes from Shearwater. Um, this one came in like the Friday of. Um, it's like Friday week, basically. Um, I, I was very tempted. It, it was very late in the day. I was very tempted to um, uh, to try and splice this into the um, into like a, the podcast a couple of weeks back, but it, it takes a lot of editing to uh, to get it all sort of back in and then re-edit and then um, and then re-render and then upload. And so I was just like, oh, you know what? I, I'll I'll talk about it in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so Shearwater have announced the uh, the release of the Perdix Two and the Petrol Three dive computers. So I think I mentioned a few weeks back that um, that there was there was scuttlebutt, there was rumours going around that Shearwater had stopped making the um, uh, the Perdix, the regular Perdix, but they were going to continue with the AI. I think that might have been like either misinformation or like muddled information uh, because basically there's there's a new version of the uh, the Perdix that's come out. There are actually two. There's a um, there's the like more standard petrol 2 uh, correction standard perdix 2 this is going to be tricky um which has titanium parts um uh, if you look at the uh, the sort of the new features on the uh, on the perdix 2 so it has a titanium armored bezel um so similar to what they did with the petrol 2 now the perdix 2 has a, a titanium bezel around the front but it also has titanium buttons um, you know those piezoelectric buttons on the sides. Instead of uh, like physical buttons that you uh, that you push, these are like touch sensitive buttons. Um, on the regular Perdix, the the Perdix One now, uh, they're both plastic, well polymer, techno polymer, whatever you call it. Now on the upgraded, the uh, the second generation, the Perdix Two, they're made out of titanium. Um, there's two different versions. You get the bare titanium, the natural um, like titanium silvery color, and a matte black version as well. Uh, the matte black version at the moment is going to cost you an extra, I think it's 100 Canadian dollars. Um, other updates, display technology, uh, it's the same as the Perdix AI. Um, it's, it's a backlit color 2.2 inch LCD screen, um, but the screen itself is, they keep calling it uh, toughened, Huh. Uh, Alumino silicate glass, um, which I have not read up on yet, um, but it must be a, uh, or I presume it's a an upgrade. A new alert system on the inside. It has customizable vibration, um, so hepatic feedback, like in the uh, like in the Terek and the uh, the uh, petrol. You have this. Um, no, not the petrol. The peregrine. Sorry. It has a, a vibration feature inside of it, um, which is quite nice. I um, I do enjoy a, a vibration alert. Uh, I just find it draws my attention, especially much more than a beep. Uh, not that the Perdix could beep, but it is just nice to uh, to draw your attention. Uh, wireless air integration is going to be the same as the Perdix AI, so it's going to connect you up to four transmitters. Um, single AA battery, um, so everything else is much the same. The The dimensions and what I can see, it looks very similar. It's just got those main updates. The petrol, which is the, uh, so the, the boxier, bigger version, but still going strong. Uh, the petrol three now, um, it comes with the natural titanium bezel, which we saw on the, uh, the petrol two, um, but now the buttons are titanium as well, so they're a bit cooler. Um, uh, AMOLED color 2.6 inch high contrast um, screen also has um, that uh, aluminio silicate glass it's like silicone and aluminium mixed together but I don't know I'll look into it um, the alert system instead of customizable vibration it's described as strong customizable vibration so i presume because the uh, the petrol has a larger body it's got more space for a bigger vibration um so yeah a strong customizable vibration um 
wireless air integration up to four transmitters, uh, AA battery power and all that kind of stuff, and, uh, and a dual O-ring um, battery cap system. So yeah, two new versions, um, or two versions of the uh, upgrades of the Perdix 2 and the Petrol 3 dive computers. Um, so they're quite cool. Uh, I don't have a date of when they're um, when they're going to arrive here in the UK, um, but by the looks of it, they're um, they're imminent. Um, there's there's no reason why they'd announce it and they're um, they're not ready. But yeah, um, some upgrades for the uh, for the Shearwater dive computer range. Sad news from the States that Bob Kirby has died. Um, Bob Kirby from Kirby Morgan, uh, one of the co-founders of the uh, the US dive company, um, in a, um, I think it was a, a letter or an email to uh, to someone, and they um, they posted it on a, um, uh, one of the dive forums, uh, I think it was Scuba Board, um, sort of said that, yeah, he, he uh, sadly died. At, it, it was at home, um, surrounded by friends and family, um, but yeah, um, just came out of nowhere. Very sad news. Um, he was um, sort of huge in the uh, in the diving industry, and um, and yeah, you, you hear Kirby Morgan all the time. He um, he was a great innovator and in creating um, uh, sort of military and commercial diving gear. And um, yeah, they they designed and created the modern lightweight fiberglass helmets that replace the traditional copper and brass helmets of the um, of the dive industry. And um, and now yeah, whenever you see commercial divers and military divers, you see them wearing Kirby Morgan or some kind of Kirby Morgan um, to the hard hat. So um, yeah, sad sad news, um, but. Um, but it's a good time to uh, sort of go back and remember all of the um, sort of important changes that um, that he made to uh, to the dive industry. So yeah, sad news, but um, yeah, let's just sort of re remember everything that he did. To celebrate their 50th anniversary, Bear, uh, who make a lot of exposure protection from wetsuits and dry suits, um, they have announced that they're releasing a, um, a limited edition range of, uh, of designs for some of their wetsuits and dry suits and some other accessories. Um, so this is all to, um, to celebrate their 50 years of innovation. Um, they say with every stitch uh, we innovated, through every failure they pushed, uh, not for profit but for performance to provide the um, the sport of scuba diving uh, with equipment that fit better functioned better and lasted longer um, so they got some pretty retro styles on their uh, on their wetsuits the uh, the elation the uh, the ladies wetsuit and the revelation uh, the uh, the men's wetsuit some people um, thought it was like a, a star trek inspired design uh, but it's kind of a, a retro design with a pretty navy blue body and then across the shoulders and down one arm it's uh, it's more of a, a bright red with some uh, some yellow details in it and uh, and a pretty retro bear logo on it uh, as well as the X Mission Evolution dry suit um, it's just a limited edition that's more of a black with a, um, uh, a green finish to it um, so yeah they're, they're kind of cool and just a little bit different it's kind of fun to have uh, some limited edition I think I've seen some limited edition wetsuits out there in my years uh, one of them I swear could have been from 1989 um, in this uh, sort of pattern on the outside and I couldn't believe um, sort of people were still wearing it but maybe maybe it was a, um, a limited edition throwback um, or something that they made themselves um, there's also 50th anniversary beanies and uh, and baseball caps um, a, a beer cozy and all sorts of things and apparently there's a very enigmatic coming soon uh, 50 years deep um, in, there's there's a button that says learn more but um, but it just leads you to the uh, to the entire department um, but yeah if you're in the market for a, a limited edition retro style wetsuit uh, yeah maybe check it out the uh, the links links to all of these will be um, down in the description below Scuba divers from the Bournemouth University Maritime Archaeology um, team, uh, or their diving team, have um, have discovered the 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 rudder from HMS Invincible, uh, and this is actually what caused it to uh, to sink. So um, they, I don't think they were particularly looking for it, but when they discovered it and they worked out what it was, this is actually quite interesting news. So. 
HMS Invincible, I think we did a story about it a, um, a, a while back. It was, I think it was originally a French ship and it was a, a very groundbreaking design to um, to have this new 74 gun capacity. Um, so when the English captured it, they they basically sailed it straight back home to, uh, to be able to copy it. But the rudder jammed uh, at one point in, um, oh, Struth, like the, the 1700s. And, um, and it's, um, it, it, it jammed so that they, they couldn't steer and then it's, um, it, it ran aground um, just off of um, uh, the Isle of Wight, I think. And, um, and yeah, they, they seem to have managed to have found it still on the, uh, the seabeds like 200 and something um, years later. And um, yeah, it's some amazing um, sort of footage coming back of uh, of what they've managed to uh, to sort of excavate and uh, and measure. And um, and yeah, it seems that this is 1758. I've just read. Um, that's where it's from. So um, yeah, it's um, it ran aground on a sandbank in the uh, in the Solent, which is just around um, uh, the Isle of Wight. Uh, if you're not from the UK, it's like the flat bottom bit of the United Kingdom kind of in the middle um, between England and, uh, and France um, but of course on the uh, the British coast and um, yeah they um, they seem to have found it so there, there is video footage on uh, on their YouTube channel I'll, I'll pop a link uh, down below so you can check it out there seems to be a fair amount of currents that they're, uh, they're, they're continually fighting against um, but yeah now of course that they have uncovered it um they're they're kind of concerned that it's it's in a relatively exposed state uh and as you can see a lot of this debris is just um, sort of continually flowing over it so um the dive team uh they first intended to use sandbags to try and like uh, protect it um but of course now they're um sort of raising it for conservation um so um but they th they think it is going to cost about eighty thousand pounds to be able to actually uh, sort of secure it and then lift it up out of the water and um but before long it is probably going to start to be um, sort of worn away from all of this debris flowing over it um so yeah hopefully someone will be able to uh, sort of step in and uh, lift it out of the water so it can be preserved and finally someone shared a job listing online for a dive operations specialist um, by roth development incorporated in houston texas um so if you don't know what that means, it's um, this is actually working at NASA's NBL, uh, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. Um, so they're after a scuba diver to, um, yeah, basically be one of those divers who helps to um, sort of adjust all the equipment and um, and help with the. Um, uh, uh, astronaut trainees uh, in their EVA training. Um, so duties and responsibilities to be able to in, uh, inspect your own dive equipment. Um, they, um, divers in this uh, position perform complex underwater maintenance, repair and mock-up reconfiguration and test tasks, including but not limited to the following. So inspect mock-ups in the pool for need of repair, uh, operate cranes to lift mock-ups from the water, uh, all this kind of stuff. So you know when they have like mock-ups of the International Space Station and, uh, and satellites and things under the water, of course the divers go in, it's this huge, huge, great big um, swimming pool, and um, and yeah, they, they sort of adjust the mock-ups so that the astronauts can then go in in their spacesuits and practice in this neutral buoyancy, um, so sort of the closest thing to, uh, to zero gravity environment. Um, and then the divers then move the astronauts from one position to a different position so they can practice different tasks uh, and obviously get the astronauts out in a uh, in a jiffy if there's a problem. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, qualifications required, uh, high school diploma uh, or equivalent education, uh, nationally recognized scuba certification, so NAWI, PADI, uh, or military or commercial license for a minimum of one year and or six months with higher advanced dive training. Uh, a minimum of 25 logged dives. It's pretty good. Um, repair, maintenance, assembly experience is strongly recommended. You're going to be dealing with a lot of tools and stuff. Um, but yeah, basically, if you're uh, if you're in the area, because uh, yeah, I, I don't think they're uh, you can work remotely in this position. Um, but yeah, Houston, Texas, if you uh, if you want to help out at um, 
uh, at MBL, check it out. Uh, I'll put a, a link to the LinkedIn job listing, uh, again, down in the description below with the rest of the links. So my product of the week this week is that Santi heating vest, the uh, the 2.0 version. This is an upgraded version on the previous version. I've said version a lot, so I'll say it once more, version. Um, so yeah, so this is a, a heating vest. It's a, a relatively thin, um, it, it's got a uh, 180 grams per square meter weight to it, which that in itself is a little bit of added insulation that you either wear just over your your base layer or you can wear it over your um, your dry suit and it just adds a little extra insulation to your core but if you're on a particularly long dive or if you're diving in really super cold waters and you just need a little extra boost it has these thermal wires running throughout it um, that's uh, it's like wearing a, a heated blanket but over your core so um, so the vest itself it draws power from an external battery um, with these you typically have a, a, a battery that sits on your hip uh, or you can like connect it to your cylinder behind you and then run the cable around it then comes to your chest inflation valve on your dry suit connects to that usually with an EO connector um, that's a, a wet connector so um, so power can can transfer and then using one of Santi's thermo valves to replace your existing dry suit inflator valve then the cable comes inside you connect it to uh, to that vest and then you control it from outside so you can switch it on and off it has a um, an over power system where if it gets too much current it, it interrupts it so you're not going to frazzle inside of your suit um, but yeah, it's it's just it's usually the first step getting into heated undersuits um, to help maintain your um, uh, your decompression. Because if your body starts to think that it's getting cold, then of course it starts to restrict blood flow to the extremities. Which if it's already had all of this gas rich. Um, blood flowing through your extremities like your skin your hands and your feet and then you restrict that blood flow it's not flushing all of that uh, that excess gas out of your tissues towards the end of the dive when you're coming up and you're doing your stops so by keeping your body and uh, and your core body warm you're kind of tricking your um, your body into thinking everything's okay just maintain normal blood flow and uh, and you're going to help with uh, with that decompression of course you don't want to accelerate it too quickly uh, which is the other side of it which is why they do have these fail safes in there to help prevent it from overheating you so you're decompressing too quickly um, but when you're using it correctly then yeah it's just a better way of staying warm and decompressing uh, just responsibly now, the smallest battery that Santi run is the uh, the six amp hour battery, so you'll get a good hour and a quarter uh, of burn time with that. But if you use one of the larger batteries, up to like the um, uh, the the twenty four amp hour battery, you can get anywhere upwards of five or six hours. So uh, so depending on how long your dive is and uh, and how much time you're spending in the water, because you don't have to have it on all the time. You can switch it on and off as you need to, just to take the chill off basically uh, and give your body a little bit of a sort of an extra external boost um, and yeah the the vest itself if you do disconnect it it's still a thermal um, sort of extra layer to uh, to keep your core nice and warm um, has everything that you uh, that you need and the material itself is now it's the second version it's a bit more flexible it's breathable uh, it's got a bit of um, uh, windproofing as well which is kind of nice um, so yeah if you are diving in uh, in colder waters or you're thinking about diving in colder waters or you already do and you start to feel a bit of a chill towards the end then maybe think about a uh, sort of a heated vest obviously you do need to uh, sort of check it out and, uh, and read up how it can affect your decompression so you know that you're using it responsibly um but yeah if you do feel the chill this really is the uh, the first step to um uh, to yes yeah, so warming yourself up moving on to my question of the week uh, which this week uh, comes from reddit uh, as a lot of my questions do uh, and the question is what is your most horrifying experience underwater um 
so I have I have a couple experiences that uh, that kind of stick in my mind. The first one, uh, the first one has both of them. They both have happy endings. Um, so, um, so spoiler alert, I suppose, but don't don't worry too much. So the first one, I was diving in uh, in Madagascar. Uh, I was doing some marine conservation work, and um, and afterwards we um, we we do a bit of work. We do um, some sort of fish ID and things, and then we we'd have a bit of extra time just to chill out and just go on a scuba dive, basically. And I'm diving with a guy called Finn. I want to say Finn was his name, and. Um, and we we spot this like shadow in in the distance in the blue and we're, we're pretty shallow we must have been about 10 meters under the water not not particularly deep and um and yeah this this blue no uh, sorry this, this like black shape is out in the blue and and not really moving so um we kind of look one another in the eye and kind of go what what on earth is that so so we cruise up to it, and um, and this thing is just getting a little bit bigger, but it's not moving. It's not moving with the water. It doesn't appear to have any fins or anything. And um, and the closer you get to it, it's this like black. It I thought it was like whale skin, like a patch of whale skin because it was that sort of almost shiny but matte black with i think it looked like it had like barnacles on it and um and it, it was just this obscure shape but there was no it, it it wasn't as if like it was a part of an animal it, it was just floating there were no like edges to it and and we kept getting closer and closer and the closer we got the, the less we knew what it was and um and it got to the point that we got right up on it and it it was just like a black plastic bag and um <laughs> you just like in your mind you're like what on earth is this, <laughs> is this thing and um yeah your mind starts to wonder and then of course you um, you see the plastic bag and oh, street so so we just um collected it and put it in a pocket or something took it out of the water but at that time you're just what on earth is this thing and and it starts that like paranoia thing inside of your mind i was on a teaching dive um in a in a quarry here in the uk um called gildenberg and um and at gildenberg they they have a bunch of like trucks and cars there's some boats there's a double decker bus that have been purposely sunk there for scuba divers so they've had all the windows taken out all the electronics and all that kind of stuff um, taken out and between them because there's usually quite poor visibility they have these rope lines um, that attach them so you can follow them and, uh, and you, you don't have to navigate basically you just follow the ropes and I'm down at oh, Struth, I don't know 15 something meters and and I'm following one of these lines I'm, I'm leading um, some students to go find one of the uh, the other shipwrecks and um, and out of the out of the gloom comes this this little shape that's attached onto a um, uh, onto a, a piece of string attached onto the um, uh, on to that rope line that we're following and someone's put just a little plastic toy shark um and this thing just kind of comes out of the gloom you're like oh struth and um it, it, it was a mean looking shark it's not a uh, like anatomically correct shark and um you're like oh struth so, so you swim around it but then your your mind starts playing games now bear in mind i'm in a freshwater lake in the middle of peterborough there's there's not going to be any sharks in there, but something in your mind goes, "Huh, what if?" And um, so, so that was one other. Uh, otherwise, it mainly comes down to um, uh, uh, like like divers in uh, in trouble. I I don't think I don't think I've I've ever had um, sort of too much panic in um, sort of with me. There's been a couple of instances, but they weren't particularly um, like horrifying. And the last one was a. Um, it, I was on a training dive. I was I was learning to um, uh, uh, to use a rebreather, and um, and it it wasn't 
part of our group and um, we, we must have been between dives or sort of getting ready to uh, to go on a dive and um, and, and we were just chatting as, as you do in like the car park of this um, uh, of this training lake and, um, and we just hear this just noise of erupting water and this guy Rawr! and um, the the instructor and I so I think I was an instructor at this uh, at this point and uh, we just look at one another and uh, we do that like instructor nod was like yep so he um, he rushes down to um, uh, to the waters edge to uh, to see what's going on. I rush to um, uh, uh, to the site management. They've already sort of heard. They grabbed the uh, sort of oxygen, and first aid, and stuff, and uh, and come through, and um, and we're sort of running back. And um, I think he was on. He yeah he was on a rebreather the chap in the water and something happens whatever I don't know the exact specifics and he just he, he ended up on the surface um, and in a bit of a, um, a bit of a panic everything was fine um, he didn't need uh, sort of medical uh, sort of care or anything but in that moment it's just that oh. Boom! Woof! We we really need to um, sort of get something done just in case um, sort of the, the worst has happened, um, because at at that point in your mind it could be anything. Uh, it could be someone seriously hurt. Um, something's happened underwater. Uh, a rapid ascent. Uh, all of these kind of things. And um, yeah, the, the the mind just during that like that run. Um, does uh, sort of start going but um luckily nothing um, nothing bad happens and um no i think that's about it as far as horrifying um sort of instance i don't think anything luckily touch was awful has um sort of happened that um uh, that i can remember maybe i've repressed it but um no it's it's for me, it's never been a um, an, an awful, terrible, scary um, sort of thing. I, I don't think I've ever had anything other than those kind of experiences where it's just kind of like, oh, maybe something sort of happened. Maybe there is a, a, a Jaws-like shark in this small, quaint lake, freshwater lake in the middle of Peterborough. Um, but um, but yeah, when, whenever you hear that kind of scream or cry, there, there was another one actually. That was um, when I was teaching, and uh, and I had some dive master candidates, and um, and they were doing some practice skills with students on the surface, um, and it was the surface swim with a compass. So you swim out twenty five meters to a buoy using your compass, and then swim straight back again. And uh, and I send one of the um, uh, one of the candidates out out and I'm I'm helping the rest of the students like get kitted up um, and um, and I just hear this mark uh, it's like oh truth so um, so I turn around and the uh, the students now like flat on his back on the surface the um, the dive master is like sort of looking at me is like help um, so I, so I swim over <clears throat> hey what what what's going on and uh, and the student his bcd is a bit too tight so um so he couldn't breathe quite properly so um so i started like towing him back i was like oh okay well, well let's just undo your um your bcd just to um sort of open your chest up a little bit and um <clears throat> and he starts to starts to breathe starts to recover starts to uh, sort of calm down and he's like oh by by the time that we got back and this is only like 20 25 meters back um and got and stood up on this platform he's he, he's relaxed again and um and he's fine he's like oh yeah i just just couldn't catch my breath um and um and the uh, the dive master afterwards uh so took, took me to one side and was just how are you so calm and it's like well you, you kind of have to be as as teaching staff you you have to be that point of of calm for the student because if if you're flapping and uh, and freaking out it's not going to help the student any so you just have to switch that off in your mind and just get the job 
sorted, get it fixed. Um, so I, I don't know, you, you just kind of switch that off. Um, but but those are the most like horrifying experiences that that I've ever sort of experienced, um, sort of in diving. Uh, I don't think I've seen any serious injuries. I've seen like cuts and scrapes and things, but nothing overly um, horrifying fish encounters neither i don't think anyone's been um sort of hurt or injured on uh, on my watch so i've either gone off very very lightly um considering my dive count or um i've just been diving in the right place at the right time and that's it for the podcast um if you have any horrifying experiences underwater uh, by all means let me know down in the uh, in the comments below what happened uh, and what you ended up doing um Links to everything, as as always, are going to be down in the uh, the description below, uh, except for next Tuesday's top tip video. I can't do that link quite yet, or I could, but the link wouldn't work, so there's no real point for it. Um, yeah, remember to uh, to head over to simplyscuba.com where we sell all the interesting bits and bobs. Um, follow, like, share, subscribe, do all that good social media stuff to help the channel grow. And if you have any questions, comments, queries, or even corrections, uh, let us know down in the comments below and try and use that hashtag AskMark, um, and that way I actually see it. Uh, most of the rest of the uh, sort of comments and questions I. I tend to glaze over because we just get so many coming through. But if it actually has that hashtag, uh, then I definitely see it. Um, as always, thank you for listening, everybody. And of course, safe diving. <laughs>